Let me uh, start this with a simple question. Who loves stood string? Okay, this is not your talk. You might want to <laughs> might want to go to one of the others cuz this is <laughs> this is the inverse of that. <laughs> okay. Sure, fair enough. All right. So, how many people want to see it to die in a fire? Yeah. All right. So, uh, Bryce, um, yeah. you need to sit. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Leaning is not really the way to do it. All right. So, I've written a Unicode library. Why did I do that? Well, the first reason is that that guy's evil. Um, so, Alistair last year in this room gave a talk um, in which we talked about like what what you know kind of we would like to see as a community from Stood Two. He brought up some stuff he wanted to see in Stood Two. Um, and one of those things was that, you know, string has a lot of sort of, you know, problematic elements. Let's make a better stood string. Maybe let's have a rope. Let's have it be UTF-8 encoded and uh, Unicode aware, at least to that degree. And I thought, wow, that's, that's great. I would like to do that. So I went and started doing that. And I did something very much like that. And I had this type that was, um, it was like UTF-8 encoded if you wanted it to be. And as long as you used a certain portion of the API, it was always UTF-8 encoded. But there wasn't a guarantee because I didn't want to leave behind people that really cared about sort of the encoding agnostic or ASCII approach, right? So for people who didn't care about, UT, uh, about uh, Unicode encoding, um, I wanted an option for them, OK? Uh, and then I started talking to people on the committee. And they had a bunch of ideas that they made me do as well. So. <laughs> and they, they made me do them in the same way that Alistair did by having good suggestions that I thought, wow, that sounds easy to do and fun to do, and so I'll just do that little piece. And I first started with uh, grapheme clustering, and then I realized, well, without normalization, you can't write the equality operation for two text objects, and so I did that, and then pretty soon I'd written Unicode. So that's how we got here, okay? <laughs> All right, so motivation. String sucks. That's the main motivation. That's what got me doing this project to begin with. And what sucks about it? Well, it has this giant interface, and it's got all these member functions that should have been algorithms, right? That's one of the main things. Um, now, I know that this is kind of a cheat because I could have written string view there, and this would work without an allocation. But this was designed in an era way before a string view, to the tune of about 20 years before string view. And if I wanted to use that algorithm, that one in particular, I had to allocate memory to do that, unless I happened to fall into a small string optimization case, right? That's crazy. Like, I don't want to have to allocate memory to run an algorithm. Like, this should be a simple thing. If this is sitting in a buffer, I want to just run this algorithm on that little buffer, right? OK. It also doesn't have a good story for large strings that I'm actually going to edit, like in a, in a text editor or something, right? If I, if I open up Emacs and I've got a billion character file, that is really painful to add stuff to the front of that file a lot of the time. It's painful to scroll through it. It's using something like std string, right? It's using like an array or a, a, a reasonably large chunk of, of the whole thing in one go. And what we want is to be able to operate on smaller chunks sometimes. And there's no good story for this when the abstraction you have is, is an array of char. Of course, there's no encoding support, right? That was one of the things that got me started on this too. So along comes boost text. So the idea of boost text is <coughs> we've got, whoa, whoop, I'm going the wrong way. I meant to go that way. See, if you use PowerPoint, there would not be a way to go the wrong way. Yeah, right. There would just be really ugly slides. I get it. OK, so, <laughs> so, so standard C++ also has almost no Unicode support. There's like, um, you, you can sit right over there if you want to. You, there's a spot over there. Um, if uh, you use the, I think the code convert stuff maybe has the transcoding operations that you would expect from some of the UTFs. But there's almost no Unicode support anywhere in the standard library. And, and this is 2018, and why is this the case? Like, why haven't we fixed this, right? Yeah, I see nods, right? So um, if you look at virtually any other major production language besides C and C++, they all have robust Unicode support. We just don't have that. We should fix this. So given that that's where I came from, the library goals are <coughs> to replace the entirety of std string, but do things the right way, OK? Now, again. When I started doing this, I had all this hope that we would have stood two. And now those, those hopes have been crushed by LEWG, who said, over their dead bodies will we have a stood two. So maybe none of this will ever land, the, the string portion of this. But I think that this is still a nice existence proof that we can do it the right way. You have a question? Um, what, why, do you, 
what, why, why does did two being dead make you sad? Like, like you're, you weren't going to spell that this thing is not a, a fixed version of split string. It's a different thing. Right? This, this ended up being that. So the, the original idea was we'd have this new thing. It would be called text. It would be UTF-8 aware or <laughs> encoding aware of some kind, right? And um, once I realized that in order to do that, you had to do all this Unicode business, I was like, well, again, I don't want to leave behind the, the ASCII or encoding agnostic folks, right? Or other non-Unicode encoding folks. So I really do want to have these two layers of types, right? Like the string layer of types and the text layer of types. Now, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. But, okay. but it's, it's not okay if you just put your Unicode one to STID UNCs? That's what I think is the direction that we'll have to do without a STID2. So it's not hopeless. Just the fixing string portion of it is probably uh, hopeless at this point. Okay. Okay. So the new spring, string has an expressive and efficient basis. Who knows where that phrase comes from? In this room, there should be several people. Anyone else? Only one? Two? Where does it come from? Three. EOP. EOP thank you. Elements of programming. So this is Alex Stepanoff and Paul McJones' way of defining what should be the member functions, right? <coughs> if you want to have a set of member functions, they should form an expressive and efficient basis. And expressive means that you can do everything you can do with that type and you can do them those things efficiently, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, conveniently. And the efficient part means that there is no other basis you could have written that would be more efficient than the one you chose. Um, and so <coughs> that means that many of the member functions that should have been algorithms become now proper algorithms and they get pulled out. Okay, because there's no reason for those things to be part of the, the, the whole surface area that someone has to learn just to use that type. There's no reason that you should have to write unit tests for all those things if you're implementing one and so forth. And everything is range friendly because ranges are the future. Uh, substringing should be easy and efficient. And what I mean by that is if you say substr on a string, you get a memory allocation unless, again, you fall into the small, small uh, string optimization. That's horrible, especially because like junior programmers frequently do like quick and dirty slicing and parsing of strings using substr, and then they have to be taken to the tool shed, right? So we want to just have the, the default be the right thing. Okay, size type should be signed. Many people are already aware of all these issues. This is somewhat controversial, but increasingly less controversial that we should have chosen a, a signed size type to begin with, and this is trying to rectify that as well. Also, ridiculously large strings aren't really a use case when the abstraction is a, is a contiguous buffer. So the string size type should be probably 32 bits. That's a reasonable size. And so that implies that the size type is int, which is nice. And we should add all the missing stuff, all those things I mentioned before that we don't have. So right now, according to the standard, you're only allowed to have the small buffer optimization for strings. You're not allowed to do copy and write anymore. It would be nice if we had an option for if you know there's a use case where copy and write is advantageous, you, you can opt into that. It would be nice if we had some way of supporting uh, thread-safe string operations, uh, thread-safe string types. Um, and if we had large, easily editable things, like back to that case, if you've got like a Vim or Emacs buffer that's you know, a gigabyte or something, and you edit something at the beginning, that should be easy for you to write the equivalent kind of, of um, editor that does that in an efficient way. And of course, we want Unicode support. The Unicode parts that we do have should be easy for people who don't know or care about Unicode now but want to be future-proof for them to use them, right? Because Unicode is a, an inherently kind of complicated spec. The state of the art for C++ is ICU, and that's like, a, it's not a library, it's a lifestyle. Like, you got to know all the stuff about it to use it, right? We want that to be an easier story for people. Okay, so <clears throat> we also don't want to require the use of Unicode for people who don't care about that. Also, I want to standard, uh, target standardization with this, and so my vector for doing that is to go through Boost first, and because I want to get it into as many hands and get feedback from Boost users before trying to standardize anything, I'm targeting C++11 for this particular library to get in as many hands as possible. Do you have a question? When? When? Target standardization. When? Yeah, exactly. So, and moving on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, no. Ask me these ridiculous questions. I don't understand. <laughs> Who has an answer for that? Okay. Um, all right, so one of the, the approaches I've taken is that of radical simplicity, right? So if I don't need a member function, it's gone, right? Until I know I need it. At one point, um, Mark Zarin, or was, there's Mark, Mark uh, <laughs> was laughing that he saw that I had a commit in my GitHub repo that said, add back in resize, turns out we need it. Okay, so I, <laughs> I had a string with no resize. I'll think, oh, I really need resize, and yeah, I really need resize. But that's the point, is that I tried first to see if I could reasonably use that without a resize. And I did that with almost every member, okay? Also, we shouldn't have templates in there if we can help it. Um, 
because I've chosen to make this very sort of pro UTF-8 encoding, the underlying character type is a char always. And because of that, uh, basically nothing in here except for the algorithms, which need to be uh, templates to handle different kinds of iterators or different uh, iterator types. Um, nothing else is a template, right? So all the string types and, and text types are not templates, yes? Char AT? Char AT. <laughs> char AT doesn't. <laughs> right. So char AT doesn't turn out to help you um, in this context. I think that there, it should be, um, there should be char AT support in the, in the API, but the actual underlying uh, encoding, or sorry, the underlying uh, value type should always be char. Um, okay, so one of the, the important reasons for this, and I think this is something that Alistair pointed out in the talk series from last year, was that when a new user sees there's some error, and it's related to this thing called basic string char stood char traits, or basic char traits char blah, blah, blah. I mean, I can't even remember it all, but, and, and then they come to you and they say, what is this? And you, you say string, and they say, why is that string? Okay, so I think it's very nice to have, if we can help it, these things not be templates. <clears throat> Isn't that something you should fix in the uh, I don't think so. The, the question was, shouldn't that be fixed in the compiler? And I, the reason I say no is because if you were to take type defs and refer to them in the error messages exclusively, that opens up a different class of problems. Yeah. And so you really need to pick one convention. And the convention that's picked is reasonable. <laughs> I just think that we're, run, we're running afoul of it when we do this. And you know, I'm not anti-template. I wrote a template expression library that I presented last year, right? So I'm very pro-template when it's appropriate. I don't think this is a judicious use of, of templates, though. OK. So we should have as small overload sets as possible. This is because we want to make this very teachable, very easy to use, very easy to, to sort of keep all the moving parts in your head at once. And um, it actually has a, a runtime cost because over, overload resolution is more expensive than instantiating templates, right? It's very expensive. Um, this is a, a compile time expense, of course. No allocators, they're the devil. Uh, allocators, <coughs> um, are the wrong way to slice the abstraction of needing to have different storage policies for different kinds of containers. Consider vector, okay? So what does vector do? All, all that vector really does is it manages a buffer for you. It, it allocates when it's supposed to, it reallocates a new buffer when it needs to. Its whole job is to do that, okay? When you give it an allocator that's not the default allocator, you're, it's perfectly allowable for you to give it an allocator that says, I have a fixed capacity and the capacity is eight, and that capacity lives on the stack. Okay? Anyone using your vector when you do that, and it's even worse if you use a PMR vector because you don't know what the thing is in the type even, right? Now you have a completely different story for using that vector. When you call pushback, you have to worry about writing out of memory in a way that you probably never did in your program before that. I'm not gonna argue whether allocators are good or bad. I hate them, they're not gonna be in my library. <laughs> your, your mileage may vary, but that's what I did, okay. <laughs> okay, so again, New functionality only goes in when it passes the litmus test of radical simplicity can't work here. There's a reason why we need this new thing, okay? Uh, and now we get to this slide. So boost text is done in three pieces. The first piece is the string layer. This knows nothing about the other layers. And the string layer is, um, uh, you know, like I said, like a better string with some sort of missing pieces that would be nice uh, to make the story of using strings at that sort of encoding unaware use case and make that, make that work better, okay? Uh, then there's the Unicode layer itself, which is essentially the Unicode algorithms uh, and the uh, you know, Unicode database that you have to have to do the algorithms. And it doesn't know anything about this other layer except that there's a couple of convenience overloads that use a text string. I'm probably gonna pull those out into their own header so that you don't have any physical dependencies there. But the idea is that <coughs> um, you should be able to use this layer by itself or this layer by itself. If you don't care about using my string, just use a Unicode layer. If you don't care about the Unicode layer, you can use my string and so forth. The counterexample to this is text because text is essentially all the types from the string layer, but using the Unicode algorithms to maintain invariants that make them Unicode friendly, okay? So you have to use the other two layers for that. Uh, but yeah, I guess I already said that. The, the first two are standalone. So the string layer, that involves text string and text string view, these are, this should not be surprising to most users, right? So string is a lot like std string, text, uh, the string view rather is a lot like uh, std string view. You can use a string view uh, as a um, function parameter and it will catch a string view, a char star, or a string, okay? 
But then you've got something novel, which is the unencoded rope. The unencoded part refers to the fact that we're in the like non-unicode view of the world in this layer of the library. And the rope part is, um, well, we'll get into more of what a rope is, but it essentially, essentially is a, a large tree-based string with chunks of smaller strings in it so that you can do man manipulations on it without having to uh, incur the ON cost of doing manipulations on a, a large buffer, okay? And then there's this other type, encoded rope view, unencoded rope view. And the whole point of this is that you can use this to bind to a rope, um, and you can't do that with a string view because this is discontiguous, and this requires, you know, it's basically a pointer and a size, or so it requires a contiguous uh, view of the world. So this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, is something you can bind to that, but also binds to string view and string. So if you do have a need for ropes in your APIs, and you want to have the one overload, instead of having to find multiple overloads like you did before there was string view for string and char star, now you can find one overload that it binds to this, 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 and char star all in, in one, uh, one go. Okay, and then there's one more type, uh, which I'll get into a bit later, <coughs> but this can also bind to this type. Restre repeated string view is essentially a string view and a count, and it represents the repetition of that string view a bunch of times. And we'll get into what that's all about in a minute, but basically it allows you to reduce drastically the API of string, because if you know, look at, at std string on CVP reference or something, you'll see there's a ton of API that's like, insert this character this many times, or this little substring this many times, and this gets rid of that. Bryce. Thank you. You can you can conceptualize this by uh, this is a pair of iterators into one of these, or it is um, a string view um, instead. So it's sort of a variant of sort of a piece of this or a contiguous range, it's which is a still, pointer in size. It's, it's a range, but it's, I mean, it's like a view. It's like a constant yeah. view of a rope, just like a string view is a constant okay. view of a string. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the synopsis for string. So we've got all the iterator types. There's nothing really interesting to see there, with the exception that maybe it's interesting that the iterator type is just a char star. Um, again, I tried to keep everything very simple. Uh, so there's default construction. The ellipsis here, this is not the actual API. Just put the ellipsis in all these slides you're gonna see that represents an overload set. And we'll get into what overloads are available. The idea is to show you all the operations on a couple of slides and then we'll get into the overloads. Um, so you can uh, construct it from a variety of things. There's destructor, assignment operator, nothing interesting to see here. The et cetera here means there's like CR begin and all the crazy overloads you have to have for those. Question. Yeah. You got your own reverse iterators. Yeah. What do they buy you above stud reverse iterators? Uh, the stud reverse iterators in some Tarkin C++ 11 is not like no accept friendly and it's not context expert friendly. Uh, and so this allows me to get those things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could you repeat the, the question a different way? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, no. yeah, I, I will when I think it's, it's necessary, but I think that when you get what I was answering. Um, okay, so again, you have these elements down here uh, that you would expect from string or most of the sequence containers. Um, and same thing with the index operations, except that the uh, constant overload of the index operator just returns a char instead of a char const ref. Yeah. So, um, uh, I assume the insider isn't intentional. Is there a reason why you don't have? Sorry, the, the what is intentional? So in, the, in the indexing operator, the, the argument type is int. Yeah. Um, is that the size type or index yeah, type yeah. of the thing? Yeah, yeah. You could pay attention and you would know that, no, but that's good. fine. You, you right. said it, but it is fine. <laughs> 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 I didn't see any yeah. of these yeah, yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, so like I was saying before, like the idea is to use a signed size type and use a 32-bit size type. And so all the, the size type for the string layer stuff, you're gonna see int everywhere. Yeah, but, but I, my, my question was just, is it intentional that you're not using a nested type get there, that you're using just int? Yeah, like a, a yeah, I just wrote int because it's shorter than size type. Okay, yeah. that's fair. That, that's the only reason I did it, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so again, that's not a, a, a char const ref, it's just a char. Uh, you might get a little bit better code gen there. Uh, it just gives me, it, it, it gives me the willies to return a reference to a small value type when it's not a template and I know what the value type is. Uh, and then here's where you get some novelty. So this, these are slicing operations. We'll get into these in detail, but these give you like sort of, um, kind of like the Python slicing um, API. That's what these are used for. Uh, and then the rest of this is entirely stuff you would expect from sequence containers uh, in STL. Yeah. But if, if, if I have a const, 
um, one of these and I call the index operator and then I try to assign the result, won't it, it'll you, work? You can't assign through the constant reference, that's the point. So the but mutable one gives you a reference you can assign through, but the other one you can't assign through anyway. But it's getting used back by value, right? That's right. It's a literal type R value, so you can't assign it yes. to it, as opposed to a user class type. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. So, um, and then, of course, there's, um, you know, the plus equals operation. There's the free operator plus. You can stream these out. There's equality and, and uh, relational operators defined as well. Yeah. So I've got a cons one of these. How do I extract a pointer to pass to additional C API, or Be do I just not do that? Uh, the question was, if I've got a const one of these, how do I get a pointer to, a null terminated pointer to pass to C API, you say begin. Because begin returns a const char star, and it's always yeah. null terminated. Yeah. Uh, I basically would literally a const char star, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right thank there. you. Um, again, simplicity. So there's no data member, there's just begin. Because we don't need synonyms, uh, because we know the, uh, um, the thing is always null terminated, I decide that synonym should go away. Okay. Uh, okay, so all the operations fit on two slides. If this was a CPP reference page, it would look a lot like that, where you've got the actual like operations by name, and then you would drill down to the page that shows you the overloads. The idea here is this is easy for new people to learn, it's easy for it to fit all in your head. If you look at the actual API for, for std string, it, it doesn't fit on nearly two slides. Okay. Okay, and so the ellipsis for the constructor was holding uh, place for overloads for all these types. So you can construct one from a constructor star. star. Uh, any range that models this char range concept, which I've got uh, defined in the library, there's a little bit of metaprogramming that does this. There's not actual, you know, real concepts being used yet. But the idea there is anything that's got a begin and end whose value type for the begin and end iterators is a char meets this concept, more or less. And so that, that models, uh, stood string rather models that. Okay, I think QString also models that. Does anyone know if that's not the case? Does QString have a begin and end that, it, that return a char, or that are char iterators? Okay, it, it, it matches a lot of stuff. It's very nice, okay? So you can construct one of these from like a, a, a stood array of char or something too, yeah. When you say value type is a char, so you're not taking it's convertible to char, or is that just a simplified statement? Yeah, I don't think, I think I'm actually Checking is same char, not convertible to char. Uh, that's maybe a hole that should be filled, but yeah, um, that's 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 the way it is right now. Remove CV. Yeah, well, it's got remove CV in there too. Yeah, it is same remove CV char. Yeah. Uh, okay, and anything from the string layer is uh, can be used to construct a string. And um, oh, I should say like, std string never appears in the API. That's the whole point of this, right? So we've got this this concept, and if you meet the char range concept, your constructible uh, string is constructible from you. Yeah. Um, String is a uh, 16-bit. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, you don't get that then. All right. Uh, <laughs> so the range of graphemes uh, that you have for a, a text type or a text view type, and we'll get into to that in a minute, but those types are essentially sequences of graphemes, not sequences of chars or code points. And um, so this is, again, I've got a, a concept here for a grapheme range that all of those types from the text layer um, are models of. And what that allows you to do is construct um, from one of those text types and get a string type, okay? And I felt like that was really important for interoperation, and I didn't want a physical dependency. So again, this is a template. This, th they're not specific overloads for text and text view, and s et cetera. There's, uh, a single overload that is a template that takes a grapheme range. <coughs> All these constructors are explicit, so when you do this construction from the text type, even though you're leaving the land of uh, encoding and normalization guarantees, you are explicitly opting into that because you have to write out explicitly that you're, that you're constructing this. You're not gonna get an implicit conversion that does that. Uh, the exception to that is the const char star. Um, I did make an implicit conversion simply because I found that when I put a string in a struct and I want to write a simple initializer, it's just kind of a hassle to always use the, you know, the, the, the string literal, um, or the user defined string literal or whatever. I, I, it's nice to have the, the string literal itself be the thing that you use to construct in those cases. That might not survive boost review, but I found that to be uh, pretty <laughs> handy. Okay, so um, all the assignment uh, overloads are the same as the ones from con uh, that you just saw for construction. And now we get to the first bit of novelty. These are the slicing operations. So 
The first one takes uh, a low and a high. This is a half open range. It's not an offset and a, um, and a length because you know this is C++. So I don't know why std string did it that way. I think that's pretty terrible. Uh, and then this one gives you suffixes and prefixes based on the, the sign of, of that value. So because we have the size type and it is uh, as a signed uh, uh, type, we can use negative indexing now, okay? And you get some nice results like this. And like I said, this is a lot like what you've seen in Python. And whenever people talk about wanting to slice sequences in C++, they always reference Python. This is like sort of the gold standard, I think, the, the Python being the gold standard. So if you have some string S with some text in it, if you say, get me from two inclusive to nine exclusive, you get me text. If you do negative indexing at the end, um, now you're saying, give me from two to basically eight exclusive, and that gives me me text. And if I say, give me just the prefix, the first four characters, you get this. And if I say, give me the suffix by saying the negative four characters, you get that, okay? It's all very simple and straightforward. And I found that this is probably the biggest usability gain that I've gotten from like the sign size and all the changes I've made. Like, this makes your life easier all the time every day in a way that none of the other changes I've talked about do. And of course, those never allocate, they always return a string view. Yeah. Does, does the string view also have a slice <coughs> the same slicing API? Yes, okay. yes. In fact, I might say this in slider, I might not, so I'll say it now just in case, but all of the string layer types, including repeated string view and rope, encoded rope view, uncoded rope view, and all those guys, they all have this same, <coughs> this same API, right? This thing. Um, so they all have um, signed indexing, and you can do this with all of them. Okay. So they never allocate these, these slicing operations I just mentioned. And in fact, I did not create any allocating substring API for a string. Like you can't accidentally opt into that because that's something people are going to do, and that's not something we should be doing. Okay, so insert is defined. Um, all the things you can insert, there's a, a variant that inserts at an offset, which is the int first parameter or add a particular iterator, which is the iterator um, parameter. And the idea there is that very frequently you've got a situation where, okay, I was doing some slicing, and now I want to go over to iterator space because I have to like make copies of that slice in some other place, or I've got some iterator and I want to you know, use it with an index, and I have to convert one of the two. You end up adding and subtracting uh, begin all the time if you don't have this. So it seemed nice to, even though it like doubles the size of the insert overload set, it seemed very nice to have this. And it's mostly the same story as the constructors and uh, assignment operators, right? So you can construct, I mean, sorry, you can uh, insert a constar star. You can insert anything that's a char range. You can do any of the types from the string layer that I already mentioned, those five types. Um, and then, of course, you've got arbitrary um, first, last, half open ranges, you know, iterator pair insertion that you've seen in all the standard algorithms. Uh, I mean, sorry, in all the standard, uh, all the SDL. And this is uh, analogous to char range. It's basically like a char range is a pair of these char iterators, right? So same kind of story. And the notable exception when you compare it to like the things you can construct and assign from is that none of the text layer types are supported. And that is because in these APIs, if you were to support the text layer types, you would essentially have a silent um, droppage of the invariance of the text types. That is that the encoding and the normalization are enforced, okay? So you can still use um, the explicit iterator interfaces to take a text and put it into a string with an insert or whatever, but now you have to write out more code and it has to be verbose and you have to opt in, okay? I don't want silent conversions from things that have invariance to things that don't. Okay, so when you have text passed to replace an operator plus equals, it's the same story as with insert, right? You've got the same set of, of overloads, uh, sorry, the same set of types you can, you can use with these, and text layer types are not part of that. But again, you can also opt in by using uh, the iterator pair interfaces. So there's equality and relational operators for these, uh, the string type, and it's defined for these uh, other side operands. Yes, yeah. Mark. Sorry. Um, so you're saying that at the text layer, you can invalidate the normalization, um, but it just syntactically more verbose? Uh, the question was, does that mean that at the text layer, you can invalidate the um, invariance? <laughs> right, that is, that is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that if you're converting from a text layer type to a string, now all we're talking about right now is text string. 
So if you're doing an insert into a text string, you can do that, but you have to actually say this in a very verbose way where you essentially say, with your text object t, you say t.base.base, comma, or t.begin.base.base, comma, t.end.base.base. Like everyone knows what's going on. Like <coughs> you can see it very explicitly, that's what's happening. So you're not going to lose the encoding guarantees without <coughs> making a very verbose and obvious move in that direction. That, that's all I was trying to get at with those. But when you're in the land of the text types, those kinds of issues don't come up. There's no way you're going to drop the, the, in, the invariance of those types. Okay. So relational operators are valid between string and a const char star or any uh, char range object, which again, like std string, is, is a model of all the other types from the string layer and not the types from the text layer. Because you know when you look at the Unicode standard, one of the things it says is you're not allowed to compare two strings that have different normalization. Okay, so normalization and not normalized are two different normalizations, so we shouldn't be doing this comparison. Okay, uh, and it's even worse for the relational operators because those would be essentially, uh, you know, subverting uh, collation, which is an even <coughs> more complicated and has higher requirements and stuff. Okay, so you can still, if you want to do the bitwise comparisons, you can still opt into them by using standard algorithms to do that. Okay, so that was all just string. Part of the reason there was so much stuff in there is because a lot of that sort of applies to the other things that are going on in string view and the other string layer types. So um, string view is essentially all the stuff from string with the mutating bits taken out. Okay, the only mutating operations here are swap and assignment. You can't do anything to the underlying uh, character sequence. Okay. So again, we have um, the uh, raw iterators as the uh, iterator type. I mean, sorry, the uh, raw pointers as the iterator types. Uh, if you've got const expert 14 support, then you can do uh, a lot more operations at const expert times. It's a very const expert friendly uh, type, but there's nothing much to see here. This is all the kind of typical stuff you'd expect. The um, one sort of major divergence from what we saw with the string slides is with string view, you can construct it from a variety of things. We'll get into what those are in a second. And you can also con construct from those same things and give it a low and a high, and those are the half open range that you want to slice from for this uh, string view. Okay, so again, we've got stream operators and equality and relational operators for these. So you can construct one of these from a const char star. You can construct one from anything that is a char range that is contiguous. So this is a different concept that adds to the char range concept where the, the, the value type you give it needs to actually be contiguous because again, the string view is just a pointer and a size, right? If those elements of that object are not contiguous, they won't work. And uh, so that means that you can do it from all the contiguous storage types from the string layer. Those are actually in there explicitly, and those types are just string and string view. Uh, the other are, are discontiguous. And uh, just like you can construct a string from a grapheme-based uh, object, like one of the text or text view objects, you can do the same thing with string view, with the exception that it must be one of the contiguous ones. So rope and rope view from the text layer are discontiguous. So you can only construct one of these uh, from a, uh, a text or a text view, okay? So all the constructors are non-explicit rather than being explicit. There's Im implicit con uh, conversions for almost all of these, um, except that it makes a lot of ambiguities when you have the templated overloads with the, uh, the, the concept constraints uh, be, uh, be uh, implicit conversions. So those, those are actually explicit. And assignment is the same story as construction, just like it was, was a string. Okay, the slicing operations, again, are the same thing. This is the same slide. All I did was add underscore view to the end of string, right? Exactly the same API with the same semantics. <coughs> so we've again got equality and relational operators defined, but they're only defined between pairs of, of string views. String views are also implicitly convertible from a bunch of types, so effectively you can write string view comparison or relational operators uh, with these types on either side, right? Or on the other side, I should say. Uh, so const char star, a contiguous storage type from the string layer, that means string and string view. Um, and of course, comparison, direct comparison of text layer types is not allowed explicitly, right? Okay, unencoded rope. Here's where it starts to get a little uh, different from things you're normally used to probably. Okay, so. I had Im implemented a rope a few years ago. I think ropes are a great data structure. They're really handy for lots of, of text manipulation stuff you might want to do, especially large buffers of text. 
And this is one of the things that Alistair had mentioned in his talk series from last year, that it would be nice to have a rope so you could do stuff that wasn't just a contiguous array of char. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'll just pull that rope off the shelf that I have implemented. It's, it's in a GitHub repo already. Uh, it was like a really basic tree-based thing with inheritance-based nodes. And then um, Juan Pedro was this guy from last year who gave this talk <laughs> about immutable data structures. It was really cool. And I was like, no, I want to do that. And so that like sucked up like a month of my life. Um, and, and here's how it works. So the unencoded rope is clearly we're in the, 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 the non-unicode version of the world. So that's, there's no encoding here. And the, the, the uh, name rope is reserved for the uh, encoded version. But a rope is a tree-based data structure. In this case, I based it on a B-tree-based approach. If you look at uh, Juan Pedro's talk from last year, he, he cited some papers. And if you look at those papers in detail, they're basically describing like very minor variations of B-tree. So I just I went to the CLS, CLSR book on my shelf and implemented the B-tree operations from that. And um, the way this works is that a B-tree is, um, you can think of it as uh, a series of, of segments, right? Each node is a segment of some longer series of things, right? Some longer sequence. And then there's interior nodes that form a tree on top of that that refer to the segments, okay? So the tree uh, is all interior nodes that give structure to the tree itself, but then the actual elements, you can think of all the data payload not living in any of the interior nodes, only living in the leaves, okay? There will be pictures in a minute that, that makes this a little easier. Um, so each leaf node can be either a text string object. Well, that's gonna be part of what's in the node. It's, it's a node for the text string object or it can be a node containing a repeated string view, or it can be a node which is a special reference node, and it refers to another one of these text string uh, nodes, okay? And we'll get into a, a bit, especially when we look at the picture, why that's important, but essentially it lets you to, allows you to do things like insert and erase into an existing node without mutating the node that got inserted into by having two new nodes that refer to the parts that are the same and some new node you make that refers to the edit, okay? And uh, each of the interior nodes has like an array of indices that tells you which child to go to um, based on which index into the underlying sequence you want to find, and then a pointer to that, um, that child. And uh, that data structure fits on exactly 164, uh, sorry, 128 um, bytes, and it is uh, over aligned, so it fits on exactly two cache lines, which makes it very fast. So each of the nodes in this tree including the leaf nodes, they're all reference counted copy and write pointers, okay? So this means the entire data structure taken as a whole has copy and write semantics, but also individual subtrees have copy and write semantics. So you can do things like share subtrees amongst different data structures. So there's lots and lots of data sharing going on. When you copy one of these from the top level, you're just copying the, um, the root pointer. And to do that, all you do is an, at an atomic uh, ref count bump, and that's it. That's the whole copy operation. Okay, because again, it's copy on write. If you were to then mutate it, you might have to copy part of the tree and mutate that copy. And that's how most cow implementations are done. When you actually do the mutation, you do the copy first, and then the copy gets mutated. The thing that you wanted to mutate when you said, I want to mutate this thing, that remains. So if anyone else was referring to that thing, they are now allowed to keep referring to the original. And you've got a copy that you mutated. So you're allowed to share nodes amongst many, many users. And if another user, one of the users out of N that is referring to a node wants to mutate it, they copy the node before mutating it so everyone else's view is undisturbed. Okay, so if you edit one of these, uh, an unencoded robe, and the edit would fall entirely in one of these segments, okay, one of these chunks of string that, that are in the leaf nodes, then what you do is you go from the root all the way down the path through the interior nodes to that leaf node. And if the ref count is exactly one for all of those, then you say, ah, I'm the sole owner of this. I get to mutate that in place. So you don't have to make a copy and then mutate it if you're the sole owner because you wouldn't disturb anyone's view of the data. It's a nice optimization. If you can't do that, then what you need to do is mutate that leaf node by making a copy of it and then mutating the copy, okay? When you mutate that copy, now the parent of that leaf node that you made a copy of is still pointing to the original, not the copy. So now you need to make a new parent node that points to your new thing, and it goes all the way up to the, to the, to the root. So you have to do log n <laughs> new nodes. You have to make log n new nodes, and that, comes, uh, that becomes part of your new tree. Yeah? Um, do you have a paper written on how you did that without race conditions? Uh, no, but I'll explain it later. Yeah. This, okay. yeah. 
Uh, oh, the question was, why doesn't this data race? And I'll explain why. Yeah. Um, OK, so the, uh, yeah, yeah. So there's tons of data sharing with these ropes. So if I make a rope from the top level and I copy it, I just make a new pointer to that and bump the ref count. If I do a mutation, then I have to do this uh, order log n operation. OK, so it turns out in my implementation, the branching factor, because this is the way B trees work, there's like a low and a uh, there's an n and a 2n um, branching factor for each node, okay? So in my implementation, it's between 8 and 16. However, if you fill up the entire tree, and by filling up the entire tree, I mean you go to max size. Max size is the, um, the, the sort of, uh, I think uh, this actually doesn't use int, it uses uh, putter diff t, so it can have very large uh, sequences. And the maximum value for uh, putter diff t, um, when you fill up the tree, you will have 16 branching factor in all the nodes because the tree is full. And what that means is that the height is less than or equal to 16, okay? So there's a fixed height to this tree. The fact that that is a fixed number means that this is now a constant. It's no longer log n operation, it's a constant operation. And I can write random access uh, to each element. I can write random access iterators and so forth, okay? Now, pictures. So in all these diagrams, I have the three node types. Remember, there's like the text node type, there's the repeated string view node type, and there's this like special ref kind of node. And you'll see, see a little S, S, uh, RSV or REF for ref uh, decorating one of those nodes so you know which kind it is. OK. So here's about the simplest rope you can have that's not empty. In this case, we've got a rope, and it's got a string. The string just says text in it, because I have tons of imagination. And then this S indicates that it's a string and not like one of the, the other two kinds, right? And um, <clears throat> so that's only one leaf node. There's no interior nodes, OK? If I make a copy of that, all I do, again, is make a new pointer, bump the ref count, and everyone's pointing to the same guy, OK? So now we've got two of these ropes, and they're each pointing to a tree with just one leaf node in it. So we didn't do any copying besides the root pointer itself. We didn't do any allocations, OK? We did that one atomic operation to bump the ref count, but that's it. So if text were, you know, 10 billion elements instead of four, it would have exactly the same cost, okay? So the cost is invariant with respect to the size of the tree because it's an O1 operation. It's a very nice property. Um, and so this makes undo systems really, really easy to write. And I'll get into some example code and how easy that is in just a bit. Okay, so something more complicated. Now we have our first two uh, ropes that we had, right? The original rope and then its copy. And now we want to insert something in the middle of text, and we want the new string to be text text. Okay, so the thing that we're going to insert is xte. I mean uh, xt space te, and we're going to insert that in index two. Right, so we're going to insert that right in the middle, so it expands out to be text text. And now we see finally an interior node because when we do this insertion, we end up with a new rope. The new rope doesn't want to disturb the view of the rope that the other two have. So it's going to take a reference to the suffix uh, that goes after the insertion point and a reference to the prefix before the insertion point. So these are the two of these ref nodes I was talking about. And they don't point to a string, they point to a string node. Again, this is all copy on write. So as long as these guys each have a reference to that, even if you get rid of these two ropes, this is kept alive by the copy on write, uh, by the, uh, the, the ref count of these two copy on write pointers. Okay? And then the actual new node that represents the mutation, that goes in the middle. Yeah? Just making sure, um, the reference, is it a string view? The reference is not a string view. Um, I take that back. I think there is a string view under the covers in there, yeah. But it's distinct from a string view um, that you would normally write in, you know, automatic storage duration because that can dangle and this can't because it is guaranteed to keep alive the reference based on the point. the, the pointer, the ref kind of pointer. Mark, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so because we've got these three nodes, <coughs> we end up having, um, this is a, a simplified version of the tree. It's actually a 2-4 B tree instead of a 8-16 B tree. So because we had more than two nodes, we can't, uh, or sorry, um, because we have more than just one node, and we have to have at least one interior node here, okay? So that's why I've got now an interior node, and this two represents that this is the end of this sequence, and the seven represents the sum of the end of these two sequences. Am I off by one? No, that's right, okay. And then the nine represents the length of the whole thing, okay? So each of these indices is like a running total of the size to that point, okay.
So this is, this is a pretty trivial operation. It looks like a lot of work to do for text, but again, if you had some very, very large string, it's very nice to be able to do this. And you're not changing the other two ropes view of the world when you do it, right? So it's pretty efficient to do for a very large working set size because you don't have an order in operation. And moreover, you're allowed to do data sharing, which makes undo systems trivial to write. Okay, a more complicated rope. In this case, we've got three interior nodes and um, we've got you know, a bunch of stuff going on here. So we've got two leaf nodes hanging off of this one. We've got three leaf nodes hanging off of this one. And <clears throat> this was presumably associated with some other rope that went away. And now these two references to it are still keeping it alive. Okay. So let's say we want to do a copy. Same story as before. Much more complicated rope. We do the same amount of work. We just do a, a ref count bump, right? So Next, we want to do something more complicated. We want to erase part of the, the um, string, so uh, part of the sequence. So in this case, I think the leftmost string, is that what I mean? <coughs> yeah, this guy. So this guy is getting erased. So what happens is, again, the, the other views don't get disturbed. We're still doing data sharing with the other ropes that exist. Now we make a new rope, and the new rope has log n uh, interior nodes that we had to make to take the place of the uh, mutations we wanted to do over here. Okay. We can't do the mutations in place because we are not the sole owner. So now we have to do these log n nodes. And each of the nodes will refer to uh, the uh, previous nodes that exist if it can reuse them. But if there's any mutations under one of those nodes, it has to make new ones from scratch. So what I mean by that is, in this case, this is 27 and that's 27. These guys are both referring to the same subtree. So this whole subtree here is shared by these two and this one. <coughs> okay. The only part of the tree that you need to introduce for the new rope is the part that, that represents the deletion of this uh, guy here. And I, you know, I, to make this slide friendly, I deleted the entire sequence that went in this one segment. It, you can obviously delete parts of segments and delete stuff that spans multiple segments and so on, but uh, now we've got, um, wait, oh, no, sorry, this is the thing that got deleted. Yeah, sorry, I said the wrong thing before. I said before this was getting deleted, but it's actually this one. So anyway, we can reuse this entire node because it's not the one that got deleted. But since when this one did get deleted, we refer to the uh, part after it. And of course, that also has a reference down here to this string. Okay, is that all super simple? Like, <laughs> we're, all, we're all good, okay. <clears throat> okay, so. We did this erasure, and that resulted in creating a copy of each node from the root to the leaf that we did the, the erasure at, right? Or the, the neighborhood uh, that we did the erasure at, because in this case, we, we erased the entire uh, leaf. <coughs> so whenever you do these mutating operations, you, you continue to share most of the interior structure and most of the, the leaf structure of the, the thing that you're doing the mutation of, okay? Um, and the thing that I just showed you was for doing an erase, but it applies to erase, insert, replace, all equally, okay? Um, and so <clears throat> as long as you pass ropes by value, which is cheap, then any use of it is thread safe, okay? And this is the thing that was alluded to before. Why doesn't that data erase? Well, it does if you're not careful. <laughs> this is how you're careful. If you always pass these copy on write pointers, which is all a rope is, if you copy it uh, instead of taking a reference to it, then you're always safe. So, yeah, Peter. The question alluded to the part where you have internally shared nodes with an atomic ref count, where if you compare multiple atomic ref counts, the initial comparison may not hold anymore when you compare the other ones. Yeah, so the comment is... It has to hold if it's unique, because otherwise you would be raising the <coughs> rope. Yeah, I figured that yeah. out. Yeah. Okay, so the, the comment was, if I'm looking from here down to here and looking for a ref count of one for everything, when I check this and then I check this, if someone made a copy out from under me, then when I check this one, the, the, the value of, of this being one is no longer valid. But that's why you have to always copy them. Because if you always copy them, whoa, whoa, whoa am I going the wrong way? I'm going the wrong way. If you always copy them, ah, yes. <laughs> if you always copy them, then either, if you see all ones, either, um, you, uh, on your thread, you've got um, multiple references to that thing, okay, in which case you're fine. Um, but if anyone else has a reference anywhere in another thread, you're not fine because somewhere in the middle, someone could make a copy, even if it's a const reference to that thing or a const pointer to it. But the fact that you, you um, 
have made a copy everywhere saves you from that because now if someone else has another copy on another thread and that's the only view they have of it, that means the ref count wasn't one. Mark. Can you ever get mutable references to the own chars? No. Yeah, I think that's also the thing that saves you. Yeah, so the, the comment yeah. was you cannot get mutable reference to the underlying chars and that's, that's correct. So this yeah. is where the old GCC copy on write string has the unfixed database. Yeah, so the comment is uh, because you could get access, mutable access to the underlying char, the old GCC copy on write implementation of string had an unfixed data race. Alan. I think I'm, I'm lo I got lost in there. So, so you're saying if you're looking down the tree and you find all ones, mm -hmm. then there's going to be an optimization that says you can modify the, the thing you find at the end. Yes. But I think the point is that you're going down the tree and you you passed some ones, um, um, then somebody does makes a copy and changes one of them. So let me stop you there. So so the comment was you're going down the tree, you see you see a bunch of ones, you're still checking. In the middle of that, someone on another thread makes a copy of your string. Yes. How do they make the copy without having a reference to it? They they have to have a reference to it to make a copy of it, correct? Yes, so it could be global. So if, so it could be global. well, it, it could, sure, it could be global. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> but, but, but if they don't have a reference to it, if they actually have a copy of the string, right, the copy of the rope, right, then there was at some point a two or greater when you went down the list. How did they get a copy? But, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think it matters whether they have a reference to it or not, uh, because if they are doing, uh, if you have, if you are doing a modifying operation, and at the same time somebody is copying the same object you are modifying, you are erasing the other. <coughs> this is not a problem that's relevant that just to the object. It's 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 a problem in general in the language. If you if you are modifying something that you are copying at the same time, you have a problem. That it's not because of LGBT uh, Okay, Mark. The way I often say that to people who ask this question is, it's the same data race that's in Vector. And if you, someone's yeah. modifying Vector and someone's copying Vector. I think you, I thought that you were saying that. that okay, so, exist. yeah, so uh, Michal's comment was, uh, this is not a problem specific to this type. The idea is if you're making, uh, if you're doing mutation and someone else is doing a copy on another thread at the same time, you're in trouble no matter what. The idea here though is if you always make copies and you don't have global instances of this type, then you are actually saved from that, having to worry about that kind of condition. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say that, uh, that yeah, that I don't think, I think the vector was a red herring because you're trying to do better. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, but yeah. I think that the global thing needs to be called out. Yeah. Okay. So the, the comment was, <laughs> yeah, the comment was, this is not the same as saying if you mutate and copy a vector at the same time, because the whole point of this is that you're, you're allowed to do better uh, if you use this type. Yes. Um, well, what, what do you mean by do better? Do better means that you're able to uh, write code that is very simple and you don't have to like have explicit synchronization. That's doing better. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from this. Um, if you guys wanna talk about this off offline, that's, that's cool, but we need to keep going. Okay, so unencoded rope, here's the synopsis. So it has to have this sort of uh, special iterator type. These are not uh, plain pointers. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on in those iterators. Um, and then the rest of it is very much like a string, okay? You have this index operation that gives you a char. Um, you have, uh, but notice that's only the constant overload. You don't have a mutable version of this mm -hmm. index operator, okay? Uh, and you've got the same slicing operations, max size, and oh, here's our old good friend Substr. So it turns out that with this one, it actually is really beneficial to sometimes be able to make a whole rope and not just get a rope view out of these. So I did provide an API for that. Yeah. Um, I, see a, I see an algorithm in your interface, and I'm wondering why you're not using <laughs> you're, you're seeing an algorithm in my interfa interface, and why is this not a free function? Well, I'm saying, why don't you just expose say, like iterators over that sequence, the, over the segments? I mean, you can use it with for each, you can whatever you want. Yeah, so the, the question is, why isn't this uh, spitting out a range of 
uh, spitting out a sequence of ranges, basically, or right? Of a segment or again yeah, or there's there's an iterator uh, yeah. that that is an iterator over ranges, yeah. right? Yeah, that that's a reasonable uh, alternative. Yeah, I, I did this kind of an experiment. I wanted to see if it was any faster. I haven't actually found it to be any faster for anything I care about. So, um, but the idea here is, you know, there's this famous problem with segmented iterators that as you're going through the segment, you have to check for each element am I at the end of the segment or not. And so instead of just doing an increment, you do an increment of branch, and this allows you to do uh, a whole segment in one go where you don't you get rid of all the branches. Um, it turns out everything that I do with Unicode stuff uh, is so expensive that who cares? <laughs> that's that's the upshot of that extra branch. Which we should talk about off home. You, you, can, you can expose it as a, as a iterator. Oh, no, no I, I get what you're saying. And there's other interfaces where I do something like that in other places. But, yeah, Marshall. My, my feeling on that is, is if, you, if it turns out that, it, that all the Unicode stuff is, is so expensive that this isn't the win, is you should just lose it. Yeah, and, and that might be the case. So this is all very much in flux. That would yeah. also satisfy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Peter. You were at the start saying you want a very simple uh, interface without any duplicated functions. And I say two functions here that, without going into all the details, seem completely identical to me. Mm -hmm. Which two? Which is the substringing and the uh, operator bracket. <coughs> uh, the operator bracket? This here? Or are you yeah, talking yeah, about the these guys? This guy? Ah, okay, great. So, uh, yeah, so this returns a view and this returns an actual rope. So, um, if this has to slice out pieces of the tree and make new tree nodes, then it will do that. This just gives you a view and doesn't, doesn't allocate or do anything, right? So, the idea is this is what you're going to use almost all the time, but it is really convenient to have this in some notable cases that I found. And so I thought it was reasonable to add that in. I've never been 100% <coughs> happy with it, and I think you're uh, like kind of on the same page. To me, Mark? I'm wondering if it's not the same as just making an unencoded rope out of your unencoded rope view you get back from the first function. Um, so you're saying more. make this a allocate? I don't understand. No, 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 no. no. Take the top one that returns an unencoded rope view, then take the rope view and assign it to an unencoded rope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can do that too, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. So, uh, yes, Alistair. With the six suppose C plus plus eleven and C plus plus twenty, I guess. Have you considered the possibility of spaceship operators for the comparisons and how that would impact the design? Um, I haven't, although um, the 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 first draft of the relational operators was made to be very spaceship friendly. So you could essentially like have all those written in one place, and then I had like a compare function, and I could just get rid of the the the, the other ones and then replace the compare with the spaceship, and it worked. There's a three-way comparison. Um, uh, and then, um, unfortunately, I ended up dumping that, and I cannot remember why right now. But, um, but yeah, the spaceship support at some point is definitely something I care about. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and the rest of it, like I said, uh, you know, nothing to see here. This is the kind of stuff you get from a sequence container. Uh, yes. Uh, given you've got an allocator thing, <coughs> why is swap not no extra? Um, Thanks for that. I think that's just an oversight. I think that yeah. should be, yeah. Uh, I think swap should be no except. I can't imagine why it's not no except. Right, and, and uh. he's right, clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the allocating stuff can't throw. Yeah, there's a weird reason why that's not no except. Okay. I've, I've forgotten why, but um, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting too, with cap, capital I, yeah. Yeah, something for part two. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, yeah. So as usual, we've got these these operations defined. Okay. So you can construct it from a constant char star, any char range, anything from the string layer, all these uh, grapheme centric ranges, <coughs> and uh, all the constructors are explicit except the one that takes constant char star for the same reason I did with string. Um, and then uh, assignment is defined for the exact same types of construction as before. Slicing operations are the same story, except that these return unencoded rope view instead of a string view, um, and they also don't allocate. Okay, uh, and this for each segment, you guys, <coughs> I think in the room probably know, but this is for the video, I guess. The idea is if you want to take um, uh, segment by segment the actual um, leaf node uh, chunks of text and operate on them, then you can make a, a, a callable that looks vaguely like this, and then pass it to for each segment, and it will you know, operate on each segment individually instead of uh, the entire sequence all in one go. And if this operation X <coughs> is very, very simple, then I would expect this to be faster, but that, that requires some testing to see which cases are, are actually faster or which is slower. 
And so the remaining operation is the same as text which, with respect to the operator, uh, the, uh, the, the um, kind of parameter we can pass to them. So const char star, uh, char range, string layer types, and then the text layer types are supported, but again, only with that verbose interface. We're not gonna silently insert uh, something with a lot of invariants and drop those invariants. So those copy and write properties um, really make it easier to write undo systems, okay? So <clears throat> here's an example of the beginning of our undo system. Uh, it's a very simple system. So we've got this new undo state, okay? So somewhere we've got a history, and all the history is is just, you know, a vector being treated as a stack of unencoded ropes, okay? Then we've got a pointer to the current place we are in the history stack, okay? <coughs> The reason it's not an actual stack is because we can go up backwards and forward with undo and redo in the history, okay? And whenever we make a new undo state, we return an iterator to the, uh, the new state that you want to do the mutations on, okay? So first, we um, go to the element after where we are, and we get rid of that and all subsequent elements, okay? So the iterator here, the precondition is it has to be, uh, you know, a valid iterator, it can't point to the end. So you go to the next guy and then you, you erase everything there. And then you take whatever's at the, at the, the uh, back of the history and you insert that at the end. Okay, so you're pushing back whatever that last history is. And then you're returning an iterator to that, okay? So this is, you know, sort of the macro scale copy on write. We're making a copy of the thing and then we're, then we're writing to it, okay? Um, and so if you wanted to adapt some you want to bind some you know, key combination to doing some insert of some bit of text. Um, <clears throat> you have some offset that you want to do the insert at. You have the stuff you want to insert. And then you give it the history and the current place you are in the history. And then you get your new undo state. You do the insert at that place. And then you return the iterator for the next, uh, the next operation. Okay, Very, very simple. If you want to add a, uh, erase and replace and so on, you could add those two. Here's undo and redo, okay? So undo just says, I've got some place in the history I'm pointing to, and I'm just going to go to the one before that if I'm not at the beginning, okay? Because if you do undo, 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 and you get to the beginning and you keep hitting undo, that, you know, we just ignore those other ones, those other undos. Similarly, if I'm doing redo, I just go to the next one so long as the next one's not the end, okay? And here's how you might write some code using this. So here's our undo history. We start with, at the bottom, we have an empty uh, unencoded rope, right? We always have something in there to point to with an iterator. We start with the iterator pointing to this only valid element. And then when we do um, this insertion, we insert it at the beginning, the offset zero. We insert the string yay. And then <coughs> we have the undo history and current history that we just pass in. It does all the right stuff. And what we end up with is a, uh, an iterator to the current history on the other side. And then we use that for the next, uh, the next uh, update. Oh, I just totally left out these parameters. So these parameters should be here for the undo and redo, of course. So <clears throat> given the current history and the to total undo history, when I do undo, I get you know, the previous guy or the one I was pointing to if it was at the beginning. And when I do redo, it just undoes what I did and points back to yay, right? Very simple <laughs> system. If you look at the source code inside of um, Adobe Photoshop, this is how they do undo. They're making copies of large um, two-dimensional arrays of blocks of the screen where you just, if you scribble across the screen, you're only touching certain blocks. So they have copy on write um, pointers to all those blocks. They will only clone the blocks that you touched and then mutate those copies. The entire rest of the thing, the whole two-dimensional array that represents the whole, all the blocks in the whole image, that just gets saved in the history, right? And it's a very powerful system and it lets you do a bunch of extra stuff. And you can see Sean Perrin has given some interesting talks about this. But the more, more important point to me is that I have written undo systems and they did not look like this. They were a lot of work. This is not a lot of work, okay? It's very efficient and very easy to write. Okay, so unencoded rope view, um, again, has this difference from, uh, from the unencoded rope where you take uh, these two offsets and that gives you the half open range that slices out of the rope view. But otherwise, it's a lot like um, unencoded rope with um, all the mutating bits snipped out, right? <clears throat> Is there anything interesting to see here? I think it's all the same kind of story. Yeah. 
So again, we have all these free uh, relational operators and stream operators. There is no operator plus because um, I felt it would be uh, violating the principle of least surprise if I took these two things that don't own storage and you added them together and you allocated a bunch of storage. I think that's not something you should write uh, with a, a simple like two keystrokes. <coughs> Uh, and I guess that same thing was true of string view, although I, I guess I forgot to point that out. Okay, so you can construct one of these from any of these, like constructor star, as we've been seeing, char range, any of the string layer types, and any of these grapheme uh, types from the text layer. And again, all the constructors are not uh, constructors are not explicit, so you can use these in um, interfaces, and you get implicit conversions to these because it's just a view; it's cheap to make these. Um, and again, the exception to that is the uh, the templates with the um, constraint on them because that creates a lot of ambiguities. Assignment is the same as construction. The slicing operations are there. They're also the same story as everything else. And we have equality and relational operators. Again, just like with, with string view, we only define it between uh, rope view, uh, unencoded rope view pairs, except that um, because there are implicit conversions to unencoded rope view, again, you have some sort of uh, implicit overload sets or effective overload sets, which is um, char star, all the things from the string layer, and explicitly we don't allow the comparisons with things from the text layer. Um, repeated string view. Okay, so this one is probably the most controversial of these types, um, assuming you buy into the need for a rope, uh, and that is because people are like, why do I need this stupid utility type? But like I said before, it really reduces the API um, surface area of string. String has tons and tons of API that revolve around doing some operation to some little snippet of stuff n times. Um, and so this is to replace those. And again, it has all the sort of uh, usual suspects. Um, it's C14 contexts were friendly. Um, and, but otherwise, it's very simple. It just has a begin and end. Uh, the view is the string view itself. The count is the number of repetitions. You can index into it in an arbitrary spot, does a little modular math to figure out the, the character at that spot, and then empty size, swap, and then the slices. That's it, right? You can stream it, and you have equality operations, and that's it. Uh, there's no inequality operations, because that's also something that's a little bit weird, right? If you have two things with different, uh, if, if they have the same string view, uh, view then it, it's easy to do relational operations on them. Otherwise, it becomes very sort of odd. That, that it, it's hard for someone to write that <coughs> it, it's easy for someone to write that and not really understand that that's what they're comparing. It's an odd thing to want to compare, so I didn't include those. Um, okay, so you can construct for anything. A string view can construct because the first constructor parameter is a string view, and then you give it a, a repetition count. So here's what it might look like. So a really common use case for this kind of thing is, you know, we've all written a simple dump program, and you probably write std string with a single space and then, like, indent times four or times two or whatever your indentation uh, increment is. Um, and you have to allocate for that, and this you don't have to allocate. And there's a nice little convenience function just called repeat that makes this shorter to write. Okay, so the string layer operations, there's some general things going on here that apply to all of them. So implicit conversions are the, uh, the uh, norm for all the view types, like repeated, uh, I mean, uh, unencoded rope view and rope view, I mean, and uh, string view, I should say. And explicit conversions for the owning types of the norm. We don't want to do a bunch <coughs> of implicit conversions for those. Um, comparing text layer types or even just interoperating text layer and string layer types is available, but again, you have to opt into that with some kind of verbosity, right? You shouldn't have implicit conversions or implicit uh, droppages of, of um, uh, var invariants uh, when you use those. Um, allocate, I mean, uh, Operator plus is defined for almost all the types except between pairs of view types. And that's because, again, I didn't want to violate someone's expectation by having these unowning types suddenly allocate memory when you add them together. Uh, and then we have non-allocating slice operations for all of them. We have uh, unformatted output operations for all of them. And I made these unformatted um, because it's in a library with a bunch of Unicode stuff. Maybe these should be formatted because maybe when you're using these, you're just in the land of ASCII. So, but for now, these are, uh, these are unformatted. And you have all the you know, normal uh, begin and end stuff for all the, the, the types in question. <coughs> These are also defined for every single one of the, uh, the owning types, the, the mutable types that are not views. OK, so these rules are consistently applied across all these types. And this makes this whole thing work, right? All these types sort of have the same relationship to each other. 
in the ways I just described, like views work a certain way, non-views work a certain way, et cetera. And this makes all these very easy to sort of remember how the semantics are and g build an intuition for how they work. Alan? Um, on previous slide number two, I think, what, mm -hmm. what is that? Yeah, tell me about that. What is that? So um, instead of making implicit constructions to string and unencoded rope, all the constructors are explicit except for the constructor star constructor. Okay, it's just so that we don't get implicit conversions to those, because if you're doing an implicit conversion there, you're allocating memory maybe when you didn't expect to, maybe you fat fingered something. I want it to be an explicit operation to do those. Have you talked yet about explicit conversions out of string? Explicit conversions out of string. Um, like the char star? Oh well, if you just say string dot begin, then you get a conversion to char star because it's always null terminated and the begin returns the beginning of the string, and the string and the iterator type is char star. So there's not an explicit, there's not an implicit conversion for that. No implicit conversion. You're just you're just using that pointer in that way, yeah. because implicit in conversions are the devil, right? right? Like we shouldn't. I, I, <laughs> and the devil makes you do things. I hear. That. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're good with that. I hear. That. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I I think I really disagree. I mean, the, I've been dealing with writing, you know. C underscore str for n for n for right. many many years. Right. And at the same time, for, you know, because we don't, you know, because because of all, this, I also have been dealing with Microsoft's um, capital C capital string s, <laughs> right. which automatically converts to char star, and I've never had the slightest problem with it. It's extremely convenient. So uh, the comment was when you do implicit conversions to essentially a null terminated string case from a string type then that's a much easier usage story. And that is often the case when you're writing code that's using those types explicitly. As soon as you enter um, generic context, it eats your lunch very frequently. Like uh, the fact that you've got implicit conversions going on in all kinds of generic code creates all kinds of problems, right? And so having those implicit constructions, um, implicit conversions available is it's something I, I very much hesitate to do anywhere. The only reason that there are a bunch of implicit conversions for the view types is because they are views. They're supposed to be cheap to copy or cheap to, to construct, and they're supposed to be used particularly as um, uh, function parameters so that you can bind a bunch of different types to them. But um, you know, my going in position is always make it explicit unless you know otherwise. So yeah, Peter. The uh, operator process between two strings is that return a uh, unencoded rope? Or does it return a new string? Operator plus between two strings returns a string. Yeah. So if you, uh, well, I don't know about horrible. But it's inefficient. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's order n. If that's inefficient, then that's inefficient. It depends on the context, right? But um, if you add a rope to something, you get a rope. If you add a string to something, you get a string, right? Um, that's generally the, the approach that I picked, right? I'm uh, thinking from the basic new person uh, trying to write some code, uh, my string equals uh, a plus B plus C plus D plus E, and that's N allocations time N copies. Um, yeah, it might be. A rope view, or a rope that it would have just been one rope construction adding a bunch of things to it, and only at the end calling it into a new string. Yeah, so the comment is that a bunch of chained pluses of strings is going to be a bunch of allocations, a bunch of temporaries and stuff. I mean, there's overloads that make sure that R values get picked up at the right time and you reuse storage and stuff. So. Some of that's mitigated, but yeah, I mean, that's that's the world we live in. Like, don't write a bunch of chained pluses if, if that's a, a value type that, that I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't do a Valerie either, right? It's it's not something you should probably be doing, yeah. So all of these types are unencoded, so you're not dealing with like the UTF-8 uh, possibility of multi-byte characters? That's right, and this, they're so totally when unencoded. So when you're indexing, you're, you're indexing by bytes. When you index, you index by by uh, you, uh, some case, number of chars. Yes. So in that case, uh, why not have versions that uh, work with uh, white characters? Uh, because I don't care about white characters. Um, so the the question was, why don't you care? Why don't you have support for white characters? I just don't care about them. Um, so uh, I, I think that UTF-8 is the right answer, and we should be all be using that. And if we're not using that, we should be using something that fits in a char. And if we have white characters, then we've got this bifurcation, you have to have overloads of all the sort of closure of pairs of wide and non-wide things, and, and I think it just makes for a very complicated ecosystem of, of types. So I'd prefer that if we can find a way not to do that, we should not do that. Mark. I just wanted to sort of 
follow on with what Peter was saying, the, these two these two classes of things, strings and ropes as you provide them, they don't really answer the problem of builder in the sense that like ad sales stir cat does. Yeah. And and so that's just left, I think, as a possible future extension to the ecosystem. Yeah. So the yeah, the comment was that this doesn't give you a way to do like a string builder kind of thing. And there is a there's a ticket on GitHub right now that says consider adding a string builder based on Peter Bindle's design. So I hope that answers your question, Peter. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it, so getting away from explicitly what happens with Operator Plus, if you want a different story for how to build strings, I think that we need that, and I think that's gonna happen, yeah. If yeah. you had a string builder, would you get rid of Operator Plus or think about it? Or no, no, you still wanna do simple operations with Operator Plus, so you shouldn't get rid of it just because you have a string build builder, I think. Yeah, Mark. Yeah. Just to follow on to that, like we've measured this, we have string builder that's more the moral equivalent of ad sales for cat, and Oper operator plus by itself is like wins when it, that's just the case. Hmm. Okay. Okay. okay, and I, I guess yeah, and, but it's how do you keep people from abusing it? Well, actually, I have a talk on that on Thursday. Okay, so you guys take that offline. I'm gonna keep going up here, okay? Uh, all right, so here's how you might choose among the different types. So I've given you like this little ecosystem of types, and here's how you're gonna choose amongst them, okay? So if I need to manipulate strings entirely at compile time, we've got this very context expert friendly string view, so I would pick that. If I wanna capture a reference to a string that will outlive the, the, the uh, I shouldn't say outlive the reference, it will, you know, a string that will outlive the reference. I, it's dangling, but whatever. Um, then I want string view. Uh, if I want a mutable string with efficient mutation only at the end of the string, that's, stood, uh, that's text string. Um, if I want a mutable string with efficient mutation at any point in the string, that's unencoded rope. A string with contiguous storage is gonna be string or string view. Null terminated uh, only string uh, fits that. A mutable string the size of a single pointer, that's unencoded rope. If you need a thread safe string and I'm willing to make copies, uh, you know, atomic ref count copies everywhere, then I want unencoded rope. A string with a small object optimization is stood string. A string with a copy on write semantics and copy on write optimization for whole copies, that's unencoded rope. Okay, so this is, this is why we have all these types is because there are really much different use cases for these different things and they, they each fit uh, these different roles. If I need to capture a const char star, string view, or text string, any of those, then I would pick string view as my parameter. If I need to capture all of those plus um, the uh, repeated string view, then I would, um, or all of those plus unencoded rope and unencoded rope view and, and uh, repeated string view, then I would pick the unencoded rope view. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, just the, um, what's the, what's, what happens is the internal pointer of uh, unencoded rope ever null? Is the, unencode, uh, is the interior pointer of unencoded rope ever null? Yes, if you default construct a rope, you get a null pointer in there, yes. Because the old GCC copy on right string did not make that case. Okay, all right, I need to, I need to move faster right, right. because this bar is not very far across <laughs> the bottom. <laughs> Uh, okay. That's your first presentation? Yeah, this, well, no, this is, I mean, it's, it's a double presentation. So I'm supposed to get to about half and we're not really about half. Okay, so the Unicode layer is very opinionated, like lots of this libraries you may be picking up. Uh, it's UTF-8 oriented, right? So that's the only encoding. Uh, transcoding iterators do exist going to and from UTF-8, from UTF-16, UTF-32. Uh, there's normalization support, there's text segmentation algorithms, collation, including tailored collation, uh, bidirectional algorithm, that's kind of in the middle of being uh, debugged, it's, it's still problematic. Uh, case mapping is gonna uh, come sooner or later, um, and searching where you do basically a collation-based uh, searching, that's gonna come as well. These are both um, uh, to-dos, but they're not fully implemented. Um, all the named Unicode algorithms, except for this one, which I'm in the middle of, are already implemented. Okay, so some terminology. People, who doesn't know what a code unit is? Who doesn't know what a code point is? Okay, I'm gonna let the two of you figure that out later because I'm really short on time. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so one of the reasons I think UTF-8 is the right answer is that in all my tests, when I, when I do any of the Unicode algorithms, anything that, that involves the UTF-8 transcoding for anything other than just doing the transcoding by itself, if I operate only on code points, which are UTF-32, versus code uh, units, UTF-8, and then do the transcoding to UTF-32 first, in either of those cases, I can't tell the difference in timing, right? This is noise in all the stuff I've been doing because, again, the Unicode stuff is super expensive. Peter. Just a small note, I'm writing it on Windows. If you do 
cloud transfer, it's faster to transfer to UTF-8 than to do everything in Windows native UTF-16. So that's transcoding it is faster than not transcoding. Right, so Peter's yeah. comment is uh, transcoding um, UTF-16 to UTF-8 on Windows is faster uh, than doing everything in UTF-16, right? And I think that's due with cache friendliness, like all the, yeah. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> UTF-8 is the most compact representation if you look across all languages. If you just look at Chinese, Japanese, uh, Korean code points, um, they end up fitting exactly in a UTF-16, uh, but they fit in three UTF-8. So that's a 50% you know, explosion in your, in your representational size, except that all the ASCII stuff you have around them. So if you have like web pages or something, a lot of ASCII characters in there. So you're giving your, your that's a two to one um, a gain if you go from UTF-16 to UTF-8 for the ASCII character. So I think even for a lot of use cases of CG CJK um, applications, you're still going to want to use UTF-8. Okay. So again, this is all with the radical simplicity idea. It's There's only one encoding. I don't have another one at all uh, in support uh, that I'm supporting at all. So this may have to change one day, but for now that's what I'm doing. Okay, so transcoding, you can transcode, like I said, back and forth to UTF-8 from UTF-32 and UTF-16. So we've got these four iterator um, template classes, and um, each has its own like make function, like make UTF-32 iterator. <coughs> Here's an example of how you might use one. <clears throat> I've got some sequence of char. I can take that sequence of char, and then I can say, give me a UTF-32 iterator. In other words, when I dereference that iterator, um, I'm going to get the next code point, not the next char. And um, when I increment it, I'm going to increment it through the number of chars to get me to the next code point. Okay, and you write a simple for loop here, and there's your code point. You can play with it and do whatever you want with it. Error handling is uh, customizable with a template parameter. So by default, if there's an error in the UTF-8 encoding, I produce a replacement character. This is what the Unicode spec recommends as your error handling strategy. They also recommend that you produce a certain number for, for arbitrarily broken UTF-8 sequences. You're supposed to produce a certain number of replacement characters in certain places. And so there's this nice uh, example in, the, in the, the spec, and I'm you know, producing the right uh, replacement characters in the right places to meet that example. Um, so like I said, this, this fits that recommendation. And the nice thing is it does it forwards and backwards. So these are all bidirectional iterators. And so if you go backwards through the sequence, you get the um, replacement character the same place you would have gotten if you went forward through the sequence. And that was surprisingly difficult to get right. <laughs> uh, there's some utilities that make transcoding even more convenient, so I can do this um, from UTF-32 inserter or back inserter, so if I've got a container of UTF, uh, sorry, uh, of, of char, and I wanna go from UTF-32 to that, I can't do the transcoding and the pushback at the same time because the way pushback and, and back inserter are, are uh, defined, uh, uh, and, and the inserter, either one. And there's also this convenience function that makes a text string from a range of code points, and then there's this UTF-32 range. You give it um, um, uh, a range of char, and then it treats that as a UTF-32 range. So essentially, it's like having this, um, and well, it has a begin and end that are um, these, um, these, okay? These UTF-32 iterators, okay. And there's a simple example of how it works. So if I've got some sequence of char, I can pass that in because this has a range-friendly interface and it itself is a range, and I just iterate over the code points. Okay, so it's the same thing as that much more verbose version before. It's, there's a lot of little utilities because I got sick of writing all that verbose stuff. Okay, normalization. So normalization is a bunch of forms. When I say a bunch, there's kind of four and a half. There's four official ones and there's an unofficial one. Uh, so the idea of normalization is <clears throat> if I see this character, um, this code point, I should have said. If I see that code point, I had better treat that as equivalent to these two code points adjacent to each other, okay? Because Unicode says those have to be, the, those are the same thing. I don't care that you wrote it in two different forms, it's the same thing. The way we get to the point where we I can actually treat them as the same is we have to put them in the same normalization form, okay? So that's what normalization does. There's four different normalization forms. I'm not going to get into what they are too deeply. Just to say that the two most common ones are NFD and NFC. D means uh, decomposed and C means composed. So these two forms are like exploding all the characters into the maximum number of code points you could use to represent that one code point that it came from or compressing them all down to like collapse all the code points down to the fewest number possible. Yeah. Which one tends to be more efficient? 
NFC tends to be more efficient, uh, certainly for space, uh, because you can have up to 18 code points that rep are representable by one code point. That's a degenerate case. Usually it's more like two or three, okay. right? But it's usually like um, better to com combine things with an NFC form. And in fact, these guys say that's what you should use all the time if you do web, right? That's the official standard uh, for WC3, 3C. Uh, there's another unofficial normalization form that is very similar to the most compact one, NFC. It's slightly less compact, but only in some edge cases. And it's very useful, and we'll see why a little bit later. So here's the, the, the API for doing normalization. First, you can check if something's normalized. So I can either check by giving a, a, a begin end iterator pair, uh, but this is range friendly, so I've got an iterator and a sentinel, like in the ranges uh, TS. And then I could also do it with a range uh, instead. And either one of these cases, what it does is there's a, there's a table you can look and does a quick check. And the quick check basically says like, hey, is this code point definitely in this normalization form? And if it's not, then um, what you can say, is it definitely in or out? So you can get a definitive answer for every code point. If you go through and there's some where it says maybe, I'm not sure, then you have to go and actually normalize this stuff to the normalization form you want and then see if it's identical to what you were given. So these can be very expensive operations. I don't know how often the people are going to actually use those in practice. So here's the actual normalization. They have the same kind of um, uh, structure as the ones we just saw, except that instead of returning a bool, they return the uh, place you ended up writing through, and they have an out iterator. So these are you know, STL, Stepanov style algorithms, right? This is the way we should be doing things. Um, <clears throat> and so these don't actually check if normalization is required. They just blindly do the normalization, OK? Oops, I go too far. And there's this convenient o convenience overload. So if I've got a string and I want to normalize it, I can do the quick check. And then if um, I don't, if the quick check is um, inconclusive or it's not in the right normalization form, then I'll normalize it to the form given. And if there's extra storage in there that I could reuse, I'll reuse that storage. That's why the convenience function exists. Yeah. Um, forgive me not knowing much about strings. Is normalization sort of? Um, uh, Similar to string compactation. If you use one of the com composed forms, it's similar similar to string compact compacting. But uh, you know, it could also expand the size of the string if you expand it. Uh, if you use one of the decomposed forms. Uh, okay. So the other uh, normalization forms that was for the NFD form. The other ones are all the same except they have different names. The only exception is that um, there is no normalized whatever for the FCC form that I mentioned before. There's this FCD form, which is a superset of FCC. That's the only thing that exists in the Unicode spec, um, or the technical note that it comes from. Uh, and there's this other thing you need to know about for this library in particular, and that is the safe stream format. The safe stream format basically says um, you can't have more than 32 code points that are being used to represent a single grapheme. Okay? Uh, and the reason that's important is because a lot of the algorithms uh, require you to like rip through an, uh, an unbounded number of code points looking for boundaries of things. And this allows you to say the boundary is at, m at most 32 steps in front of me for, for all these algorithms for which that applies. Okay? The longest sequence of things that is considered one grapheme is 18. Okay? And that is a degenerate form that is there for backwards compatibility that's not really used. Okay? So 32 is way more space than you need. So this is perfectly reasonable. You're allowed to say you're a conforming Unicode implementation and, and, uh, use this and, and assume the safe stream format. In other words, assume that that, that 32 uh, is a hard limit. Uh, yeah, I already said that. So there's a bunch of text segmentation algorithms in Unicode. Uh, and they allow you to chunk up the text. You can find graphemes, you can find words and sentences, you can find lines, you can find paragraphs. Paragraph uh, is not an official um, break, but you need the paragraph break to do, I think it's line breaking. And so, no, no, I'm sorry, you need it to do the bidirectional algorithm. And so I went ahead and just made it its own thing because I needed it and you might as well have it. Um, <coughs> so all these algorithms operate on sequences of code points. You can use the transcoding iterators uh, to get to code points from UTF-8. Um, and the word and sentence break algorithms um, should be tailorable. So like, you know, if you've got your favorite editor and you double click on a word, it selects some stuff. And if you go to a different editor and you double click on a word, it might select more or less stuff. Like maybe it includes a comma, maybe it includes a closed paren, maybe it doesn't, that kind of thing. So you want those things to be tailorable, right? That's not in there yet. So 
Sometimes for doing that tailoring, you need to do the tailoring in terms of what graphene property or what property, in this case, it's applied to graphene clustering, um, is uh, returned for a particular code point. Uh, and so this function and a function like it for each of the kind of, of um, text segmentation things is available. You shouldn't have to use it unless you're doing tailoring and only certain tailorings. But here's the, the um, way the, the API looks for most users. So um, this is the low level part of the API. So if I want to get the previous graphene break, the idea is I give it the bounds or you know, I, I provide the bounds of the entire sequence and then I give the iterator to where I'm at in the sequence. Okay. If I'm at the beginning of a grapheme, I just return that. If I'm anywhere else from the beginning of the grapheme, I back up to the beginning of it, okay? The next, um, I'm sorry, that's just the overload for this. Yeah, sorry. The next grapheme break uh, is a similar story, except I don't need to know the beginning. I just need to know where I'm at and the end of the sequence. And for this one, I, it's a precondition that I'm at the beginning of a grapheme break, and I'm gonna go forward to the next break, okay? And you can use that pair to do something like this. So if I give you the bounds of the sequence and the certain iterator, it's kind of like if I do the thing I was talking about before, I double click on a certain character and it highlights the word. In this case, it's a grapheme, so you wouldn't do that with graphemes, but the idea is the same. The API is the same for all the, the uh, text segmentation algorithms. The idea is from this iterator, I can find the um, code point range that um, this iterator falls within. Okay, so this, Iterator falls within some grapheme, that code point range is the bounds of that grapheme. Okay, so I do that by backing up to the beginning and then going to the end. Uh, and these are just the two overloads, one for ranges and one not. So I'm gonna keep going for a couple minutes since I'm a little bit behind. Uh, okay, so, and here's how you might use this. Um, you've got some string, you get your UTF-32 range, so you're using this overload, and then you provide some particular iterator to some spot and that gives you the, the uh, range of code points and you iterate across the code points, okay? Because the thing that this is returning is a code point range, and so we use the range-based for loop for that. Does that kind of make sense, everybody? Oh, I'm sorry, I wrote, um, I wrote auto there for some reason, but that is a code point range. These are just overloads of each other. I'm not sure why I left that auto there. Um, which is bad editing. Okay, and now here's the fun one. This is the way we get all the graphemes, right? So if I give you the entire bounds of the sequence, this is a lazy range, and now, now this time I left the auto there on purpose because it returns some complicated thing I don't want to describe. The point is it returns a thing that is a lazy range over all the graphemes. And there's another overload for the range version. And here's how I would use that. So I would say for all the UTF-32 code points in this string, give me all the graphemes, and for each grapheme, I do a step down here, and in this case for each grapheme, I would iterate over the code points maybe or whatever. Okay, so. This is the way I want my code to look. This is the way I want to write stuff. It's very efficient. It's just as efficient as doing the other forms that are more verbose. It's just a much nicer API, okay? So all this does at its base is say, next uh, graphing break, next graphing break, next graphing break over and over again and use the previous um, earlier bound to, to give you the pair of ranges going through, okay? Um, we will stop here. Fortunately, my speedy Delivery caught us up a little bit, and we'll, we'll resume after the break. All right, thanks.